I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Those kind of stairs, scary I was, stairs, aren't they? Or it's just I, me? I know. I had Rob help me up the first time. I was going, I can't get down. Yeah. So you have to. I know. It's like. And I think everyone here has eyesight. <laughs> See anything back? I know the feeder guys have. I know. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon. We're going to get started. So welcome. I hope everybody had a chance to have some pizza, and I take a little break. Uh, my name is Mark Kenny. For those who don't know me, I teach in the legal assistant department. And I also teach business law here, and uh, I've been asked to introduce our speaker. Before I do so, just so you know, if you have questions as uh, the presentation goes along, they've set up a mic over here on my left. And so if you have a question, just come down to the mic. They had a problem in the first session, hard to hear some of the questions. So if you have a question, please just come down to the mic, and they'll put a light on there, and then Sheila can see you, and then she can hear your questions. So uh, welcome. Um, I've been asked to introduce Sheila. So Sheila. As an instructor of the legal system department, I'm very pleased to say that she, Sheila started her educational career here at Red Deer College in the legal assistant program. So she took the legal assistant program, then she moved on to university transfer, and while she was here at Red Deer College taking those courses, she became president of the Students Association here in Red Deer College. She then moved on to the University of Calgary, where she got her Bachelor of Arts degree. She worked for a global, um, um, oh, I meant staffing firm, and then um, a few years ago, she started her own company. So she's the founder of what's called TAG Recruitment Group, which is a Calgary-based recruitment and staffing firm. In its first year, it made over $1 million in sales, which anybody in business knows is a phenomenal uh, accomplishment. Um, a few years later, that her company TAG won the Bennett Jones Emerging Enterprise, year of the War, Enterprise of the Year Award. Uh, the company has been recognized several years by Alberta Venture Magazine as one of Alberta's fastest growing companies. And Sheila herself has been recognized several times as can one of Canada's top women entrepreneurs. So we're very pleased to have such a distinguished speaker here today. And please join me in welcoming Sheila. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Well, hello, everyone. We're trying out some different microphones on, on this session. Uh, and as, uh, as was pointed out, at the end of the session, you'll, there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions. So there is a mic over here. Uh, so delighted to have the opportunity to be back. Um, I said in the first session, when I finished my legal assistant diploma program, that was back, back in the day when the college was celebrating its 25th anniversary. And I see now from all of the TV screens, it's now the 50th anniversary. So I'm delighted to be here, but I'm feeling rather aged to say the very least, since, um, since way back when. So happy to be back here. This afternoon, what we're gonna talk about are two things. Two things specifically, which are how to get, really at the end of the day, how to get hired. And how to get hired, people always say, well, what's the, what's the magic formula? Really what it is, it's these two things. It is having a standout resume, and we'll talk about how to create a resume. And let me give you a hint. It's not a long list of bullets that describe what you did do. So we're gonna completely rewrite how you do resumes in a well-rehearsed interview. So we'll talk about interview prep and how you're gonna knock that out of the park. So first, 36 random interview, or random resume tips. If you don't write these all down, at the end I'll give you my website. Uh, I'm launching a new website in about the next 30 days, so you'll be able to download everything right off our website. Um, so the interview and resume tips will be there. So starting off first, this might come as some surprise, a surprise to some of you. We, when your resume is submitted, we actually don't read every single line. In fact, it gets about 10 seconds, that's it. So what we want to do this afternoon is make sure you know how to make your first 10 seconds count and hopefully how you can get an additional 10 seconds as well. So next one is send in a Word document. Do not send in a PDF or a WPS format. A, a Word document is universal, that works. PDFs can sometimes, they just go into a black hole. And if you've uploaded into what's called an applicant tracking system, if you apply online, we have many that just go into the abyss, never to be found again. You all know this, but I still see this every day. Never include any personal information. Um, social insurance number, marital status, number of children, medical conditions, none of that. That's your private information. I love this. Use the name that you wish to be called. So I always say, if your name is Robert, but you go by Bob, use the name Bob. Your resume is not a legal document. 
yes, you want to be truthful, but just make it easy and use the name that you prefer to go be called by, rather than it sound when that recruiter calls, it sounds like your mother is calling you, calling you by your formal, formal name. So just use that name you wish to be called. Um, cover letters, doing, I'm sure many of you here have spent hours painstakingly writing out a beautiful, eloquently written um, res or cover letter that talks all about how you're, you're a great fit for this position and summarizing all your skills. And you know what? We never read them almost never. When you upload your resume and your resume and your cover letter to an online system, it, it's smart enough to go, this is a cover letter, this is, this is a resume, and the resume is the one that we actually see and it just tucks that cover letter away, never to be, never to be seen. Unless it's specifically asked for, don't worry about a cover letter. We're all too busy, we don't read them. If you do and you say, no, I really wanna do a cover letter, then if there's anything important in that cover letter, then, then do repeat it again in your resume. So that's one that is uh, very important. And I love this. Your gorgeous face should never appear on your resume. Never, ever. I had, in, file sizes can be manipulated now. I had a resume that completely crashed my system for about, it was about three hours before we could get it back. The file was so big. So, it, you know, as gorgeous as you all are, it just don't put your, your picture on your resume. It frankly, it just comes across as goofy. End of the day. Um, use spell check and use real words. Yes, we see made up words all the time. So use spell check it as your friend, have someone else read your resume just to make sure that it, it is using real words. And yes, grammar counts. We look for punctuation. We look for proper use of grammar and all of, all of those things that are really important. Things like there, there, and there. We all should know the difference between and those can be the difference. I have, I have clients that if they see one error, one spelling mistake on a resume, it's done, done. So lots of marbles on that one. Um, your contact details should appear at the top of your resume. You're saying, yes, of course. They do not put them into a text box. What can happen is if you put your data into a text box, that actually says to that online system, there's nothing important to read here. So it's almost like that doesn't exist. And then the first two words on your resume, which are usually career objective, that becomes your first and last name. Again, never to be found. So just put it right at the top of your document. Um, yes, do include a phone number and email address. I see resumes every single day. I, I get so excited, see a great background, and then there's no contact information. It happens more than you would, more than, more than people think. Use a professional email address. So by that, I mean, it's now time to get rid of the cute Hotmail account uh, email address. So cutiepie12 at hotmail.com or studguy22 at hotmail.com, those need to go. Um, what a professional email address is, it's your first name and your last name. No date of birth, no whatever year you guys were all born, I don't even wanna guess. So don't put your year of birth, just first name, last name. And your email address when you apply should always actually have, it should appear as your full name, not just your first name or first initial, it should appear as your full name. Because I know I get hundreds and hundreds of emails a day, and if someone calls and says, hey, it's, it's Bob calling, I wanna see if, I, if you received my resume. Again, if I'm looking for Bob, Bob Smith, and he goes by Robert, I'm never going to find him. So oh, be consistent and use both your first and your last name. And I said that earlier today in the first session, after leaving college, this is when you want to get familiar with and be comfortable in using both your first and your last name. This truly did happen a week or so ago. I had five interviews in one day and they were all with gentlemen by the name of Mike. So five mics, and then of course, inevitably there was follow-up from each of the mics. And some of them used their last name, but three of them didn't. So I would always have to say, which mic might this be? So when you do any kind of follow-up, just get comfortable, use your last name. And we, that one, that one do really get comfortable with. Um, your home address actually does not have to appear on your resume. So if you're looking to apply in another city or in another province, you actually do not have to put your home address. Phone number and email is just fine. And in, in, I see that in, in Calgary all the time where people just don't want, for privacy, they don't want to have it published where their address is. So it's completely fine not to have it. Um, and just in terms of formatting, we'll look at some specific examples, but just some broad, broad categories. 
we always we look for some can look in the same spot for information all the time. So company name, position, title should be bolded, and those are always on the left. And you'll see in a minute I get left and right mixed up, as I found on the, the first session this morning, a little a little reversal of left and right. So we'll come to that in a second. So left bold category should be employment history, education, extracurricular awards and scholarships. And I love this. If you put interest, make it interesting. Reading, Facebook, gardening, whatever it is, those really aren't interesting. I want, I want neat stuff that's going to set you apart. So if you've jumped out of an airplane, if you've climbed a mountain, if you've built houses for Habitat for Humanity, if you've volunteered for an organization for the last 10 years, those things are interesting. So you always want, when you're newer to your career, you want ways to make your resume stand out and look a little bit different than the other 200 resumes that are following. Um, references do not include on your resume, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute, but res you want to be able to control when your references are called. If they're on your resume, you're, you have absolutely no control on whether they're called before your interview, after your interview, so just keep control of that, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, resumes are always chronological. <laughs> the ones, it kind of looks like a bowl of alphabet soup when you have resumes that start off in 2004, then they jump to 2012, and so on. Just to, some people group them based on category. It, it's way too confusing. Chronological is the fail safe formula. So most recent first and then go backwards. Um, indicate if your diploma or degree was awarded versus if you are partway through the program and you're taking a segue out of school and back into the business world. So very important to indicate if it was awarded versus just attended. Um, and as much as we are spending time every day trying to find skilled people for positions, where my recruiters are on LinkedIn, they're on job boards, they're in our database looking for keywords. So one, for instance, today that my team is working on we're looking for AutoCAD operators. So they are doing every search around AutoCAD they can. So let's say you did actually take an AutoCAD course in high school, uh, and that's not listed on your resume. You just have that you're, you have taken, you just have MS Office. I'll never find you. So think about the things that you're seeing in job postings of what people are looking for for skills, whether it be experience or software, and make sure your resume is keyword searchable. So we're trying to find you as well. Um, use a proper footer for page number and your name, and even better yet, your phone number. And by proper footer, I mean actually use a footer rather than guesstimating where the bottom of the first page or the second page will be. We see that all the time because we, we have to manipulate and take data off resumes. So we'll see that, that someone just ends up putting, putting where, right into the Word document where the footer is rather than doing insert footer. But you're all smart, you guys can do that. Um, have a month and year, so month and year start and end dates for each position. Align the dates to, yes, this should be right. So align the dates on the right. So company, position, title on the left, and month, year on the, on the right. Again, bold. That's just where we look. And what we actually look for is when one position stops, does another one start? So if there's gaps, you'll probably see on resume there's a big circle there. So be prepared to talk about gaps in your resume. And I'll talk about if you're working part-time, how to integrate that in. Um, go back to 10 years or to high school. So we don't want you to put on elementary school or junior high school education, high school onward. And then, then as your career develops, we look for about 10 to 15 years of experience on your resume. So you just keep dropping off what's older. And after 10 years, do start to think about taking your date from high school off because, again, you're just telling everyone how old you are. And it gets to a point when you don't want to have that as common knowledge. So um, volunteer work should absolutely be included. And include all your awards and scholarships. Include those from high school. Include them, include them from college. Those are really, really important pieces. And they really tell us a lot about, about you. And when you're shaping your resume newer to your career, you want to stack it with as much good information as you possibly can about, about your achievements. Um, athletic achievements is one that I see missing from resumes a lot. And I have, I have a number of sales clients actually in Calgary that they, certainly degree is, is 
mandatory for admission into the organization. But their preference is to hire people with, uh, with a competitive athletic background. So if you were, were on the Kings or Queens, um, if you were competitive in high school or even in college uh, or at a provincial or national level, that becomes really important. Because to an employer, what that says is, hmm, they're, they're diligent with practice, they, they're disciplined, teamwork, competitive, and they like to win. So all good, all good things. So athletics is one I see understated a lot. Um, if you're involved in clubs and societies, include those. Um, include if you've worked while you were in school. The reason that's important, it doesn't matter where you worked, if you were a server at Earl's or your, your um, customer service at Sobeys, what, what matters to an employer is that you've been able to balance, let's say, 20 hours a week while taking a full course load and never missing a shift for two years. So to me, I will, if I have two candidates that are, are equal, I will favor the one that's had the more complicated workload and has demonstrated th that if they're working through school, that they've, they, they, have, they have a little bit more stick to -itiveness. that's not a word, uh, but they're able to, they're certainly able to commit. So very, very strong. Um, use a font. I love how these are random. Use a font other than Times New Roman. Out of the about 30,000 resumes I have in my database, probably close to 99% of them are in Times New Roman. And after I read a few hundred resumes a day, I just, you, you want to find ways to stand out and Times New Roman is not it. Now, the, the comic book font, that's also not a good font to use. So just saying that, pick something in between, Arial, Tahoma, Calibri, but just delete Times New Roman. Um, use your own design for a resume. So pick your own fonts, pick your own style of, of how, it's, how it's going to be laid, laid out versus using a Microsoft template. Again, once you've seen a few thousand of that same template, it, it, the resume just starts to blend in and you want to stand out. And we're going to spend a bit of time on this. On, a, on your resume, I want you to think about writing more about your successes and achievements rather than your functional responsibilities. And I'm sure there's still in a book, a book in the library, is the library here or resource, resource area, that said to write a resume, you need to make a long list of bullets that describe what your, what your responsibilities were. Everyone's taught to, read, to write a resume that way. We're gonna erase that, and I'm gonna show you how to turn, turn that on its head and write more of a success-driven resume. Um, 10 font, anything smaller than 10 font is too small, eight, nine. There's an exception to that, which I'll get to. And then anything over 12 outside of headings is just yelling. So if I get a resume in all in 16 font, it hurts my eyes. So 12 is, 12 is about as big as you want to go. And then headings 14, anything, any footnotes, if you want to reference that you've been in school while working, that can, that's the exception to go to a, an eight or a nine font. So this, my animation disappeared somewhere along the way today. So, People are always surprised in those 10 seconds what we, what we actually do read on a resume. So I'm sure all of you have spent time putting together a beautiful objective, a skills summary, um, a breakdown of all your skills, it might be some achievements. So know that none of this actually ever gets read. So you can keep it, uh, but if you need space on your resume, I wouldn't waste it with this. And the reason being is that all that we're scanning for, and I'll show you what we do read in the first 10 seconds, we skip again that whole top part, skills, qualifications, and then we just go straight to employment. I want to know where you've worked, what your position was. I want to know how long you were there. I'm gonna scan down these dates to see how long have you been at each company and are there any gaps? And then I'm going to see, do you have a diploma or a degree? And with, those, with that 10 seconds, I'm going to decide if I'm going to read a little bit further into your resume and scan for any achievements or if I'm just gonna go on to the next resume. So that's, that's kind of the magic bit. That's all that gets read. So know that in these 10 seconds, we're gonna talk now in, in a few minutes about how we make those 10 seconds count. So as I referenced earlier, we were all taught, and you might have been taught in high school as well, to write what we call a functional resume the bullets, I did this, I did customer service, I was the cashier at Sobeys, I delivered, it. I priced goods, I helped customers out, I did returns. 
what you did. So, but really what we're aft, after in a success-driven resume is how well you did it. So it's, if you were a cashier at Sobeys or customer service, I want to know, I want to know that next step. So tell me, tell me how, why you were good at what you did. You might have secured 100% on a mystery shop. You might have gone through, you might have worked for Sobeys for five years while, through high school and through college without ever missing a day. You might have been recognized in some way. You might have 100% accuracy. So no matter what the position is, I want to know how well you did it because that's going to make your resume stand out. So. I'll give you, I'll show you some examples. So how rewriting a new resume, we're gonna take those long list of bullets and we're actually going to put them into a couple of sentences. And the reason that that, it, that works is that when you're telling an employer that you are capable of actually stringing together some thoughts and putting them into sentences. So, and it automatically stands out because no one does it this way. Well, except the people that we work with and they all get, they all get jobs. Um, achievements. We want validated successes, milestones, and any way that we can think about numbers, percentages, or rankings. So I'll give you some ideas. So again, recognizing that many of you have had your, your work, you're finishing your education and moving on to professional careers. So at this point, it might be retail, it might be customer service, it might be serving. So you're thinking, well, how do I make that sound exciting? Well, here's, here's some examples. So reporting to the general manager, I was responsible for serving restaurant guests, ensuring an exceptional dining experience. We all know what a server is, but you've made this look different than all the rest of the resumes that say weighted tables, delivered service, dropped off food, etc. Then we'll go, into, we'll go into successes. If you worked in construction, reporting to the construction supervisor, I was part of a 20-person crew responsible for directing traffic through the zone, ensuring safety of both crew and those driving through. Good. Reporting to the store manager, retail, I was accountable for delivering an exceptional customer service experience to all those who entered the store. So a little bit different flavor of just positioning. And it, it looks different, and you're after different, and stand out. So, you're probably saying, well, great, how can I talk about achievements when I don't really have experience? So academic achievements, absolutely. Involvement in clubs and societies, sports involvement and achievement. Did you work in school, your attendance, your recognition, and your volunteer work? You might have, you might have consistently volunteered for three organizations covering at least 10 hours per week for the past five years. That's interesting, and that, that tells me, again, about your ability to balance. Um, so think about, so some ideas about how you can create um, your key successes. So think about ways that you were recognized. Where did you excel? Again, it's work, school, volunteer. Where did you rank amongst your peers? You might have been the top two ser or top number two server at Earl's for nightly drink sales, or you might have won six awards for product promotion of a specific nature. Where did you add value to the company? Were you ever promoted? Have you ever been given additional responsibility? So you might have been a uh, um, customer service person at, at Sobeys, but also given a, additional responsibility because you were so reliable. Those are huge things. And, and I find very often people newer to their career miss out on things that, that really, really do make them stand out. And you think, well, that's not related to, I want to be a business analyst, that's not related to it, or I want to be a legal assistant. Um, it's, it's all about your past behavior that tells an employer very likely how you're going to perform in your next position. And at the end of the day, we're looking at what made you stand out. So examples, attendance, work 20 hours per week while maintaining a full course load, volunteered 10 hours per week for the past year, secured X position out of 200 applicants, nominated by your peers for X award, um, performance ranked in the top five out of 40 reps or 40 servers, achieved a 3.99 GPA. I think most would like that. And, and I clarified this morning, as I said, this, I, when I was here, we had a seven GPA. So I thought, well, this, if it was seven, don't put that you got a 3.99. We'd figure out a different way to do that. Um, nominated for Student of the Year, recognized with the Alexander Rutherford Scholarship, consistently exceeded nightly beverage sales goals. So just some, some ideas. So think about how you can take your background and really talk about what are the things that made you stand out. And in resumes and interviews, yes, you want to stand out. So this is what an old resume looks like. 
and this might, might be a little bit more of what your resume might look like, very familiar, company name, position, some dates, bullets. Responsible for cold calling, networking, marketing, sold many new accounts, wrote proposals, handled objections. So it's pretty, there's, there's not a lot of commitment on diving deep. I get that this person's in sales, but are they a star? Probably not, probably not. Or at least they haven't told me. So take this same resume, and here's, here it is already done. So first thing you'll notice is that we've got, the dates are now really complete. We've got January 2012, just rather than 2012 to present. I've taken all those bullets, all of them, and put them into one sentence. And then, rather than saying that I was good, I validated how good. I'm ranked in the top 10% in Canada. I was 125% over plan. I, rather than securing new clients, I want to know how many, how many, how much, how big. So secured 52 new clients in 12 months. When I get this kind of data on a resume, the conversation that I'm able to have with a candidate is far different than that candidate who comes in and says, I was in, yeah, I was in sales and I, I did this kind of work. This tells me, I want to say, well, I'm excited now. How? How did you, this is a lot of new clients. How did you do this? What were some of the things that you do? So the conversation you have is a lot different. The other, the other benefit of doing a success-driven resume is I hear all of the time when people say, well, I really don't like bragging about myself. I just, I find that uncomfortable. Well, here's the, here's the great thing. If you put your successes on your resume and you're uncomfortable about saying, I did this, you can say, well, as you can see from my resume, I did quite well in that position. I was able to secure new clients. I think it's 52, you can see it on my resume. So it's a way of, of being able to, um, to reference successes without feeling like you're bragging. But you do wanna brag when you can. So I love this cartoon. So we're gonna turn from resumes and talk about, talk about interviewing. So this I, this I think does go through a lot of people's minds. My short term goal is to bluff my, my way through this job interview. My long term goal is to invent, invent a time machine so I can come back and change everything I've said so far. So my, a lot of my interviews are like this. So the fun, and if you do have a chance to work with a, with a, a recruiter, do because my interviews that I have with, with candidates every day are a coaching interview. So I'm going to say to you, oh, whoa, 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 don't ever say that in an interview, or let's rephrase that, or this is how that's coming across. So really we're the time machine if you work with a, with a, a recruiter. So let me ask you this, who do you think gets hired? The person who is the best interviewer, or the person that is best skilled and not necessarily the best interviewer? What do you think? It is, it's the best interviewer. So you might have all of the skill, you might be the most qualified person, but if you, if you don't have the tools on how to prepare and really knock that interview out of the park, then, then sadly it might be a number two spot for you. So let's talk about how we prepare. So first of all, just random about interviews. So this one, and I had, there were some great examples in the first session this morning of people that came up after. And these people were coming in with a good, good firm handshake. Learn, I know we don't do this every day in college, but going into the business world, there's, this is so important. So sounds silly, but practice. And get, get your girlfriends, your, your guy friends, your buddies, your teachers, get them to say, okay, is this good or is this a limp fish handshake? So get a good firm handshake. Um, purses go on the floor. I carry one the size of a small suitcase. So you can imagine if you come into a boardroom table and you set it right on the middle of the table, no, purses go on, go on the floor. Um, take your coat and scarf off. I've had, I've had candidates sit in my office and they look like they're about ready to run at any minute. And I'm, Can I take your coat, your scarf? No, no. Do take it off, look like you're gonna stay, that you're not planning an exit strategy. So that's important. Um, I'm a huge Starbucks fan, absolutely. If I have a nine o'clock meeting, I would love to take my Starbucks in with me, but that just looks a little too casual when you come to an interview with your own coffee, with your big jug of water. Know that the interviewer is going to offer you coffee or water, what have you, but it just looks too casual, so leave it in the car. 
Um, so, so this one always, it's one I, I talk more about in the summer months. But sunglasses, make sure they're tucked away in your purse. You leave them in the car. It, it, again, it looks a little too casual to be sitting in an interview with your sunglasses on the top of your head. So tuck those away. Um, image counts. It does. So I've had the most brilliant candidates somehow go through the wrinkle factory by the time they leave my office and go to see my client. They arrive in the, with their suit and their shirt all wrinkled or coffee stains down their front or their shoes not shone. So image counts. And all of you being, being business students at the School of Business, you're very likely going to be looking to go into corporate environments. So um, attire for interviews, I know there's whole sessions on that, but attire is really important. And it is, it suits. It is, you can't be casual when you go to an interview. You always dress, dress one level up from how you think that the client is, your client is going, or your interviewer is going to dress. For the women in the group, yes, a suit jacket is required. Going to an interview with sleeve, sleeveless doesn't work, too casual. So um, think about formal business attire. I know there's a whole seminar on that, but that's important. Um, bring a copy of your resume with you. Now, I'm going to start to sound really old school, but <laughs> I'll tell you what happened. I had an interview a couple weeks ago talented, talented guy, just finished his degree. So he comes in, he sits down, and then he just starts, his face is in his phone. So I thought, well, maybe he's, maybe he's updating his status on Facebook. Maybe he's sending a text to someone. I don't know. So I said, you just let me know when you're ready. And then he, he looked shocked. And he said, oh, I was just getting a copy of my resume. And I said, well, here's how that looks. It looked like you were updating your status on Facebook. So Devices are great, but but that takes away the face time and the rapport building time from from establishing yourself in that interview. So if you if you're if you're tied to your device to have your resume on your iPad or on your on your phone, great. But just know the an easier way, make it easier on yourself. Take a copy of your resume and and put it in your portfolio. And I had a fabulous question this morning. This student came up to me after and she said, I'm really embarrassed to say this, but what the heck is a portfolio? And I said, oh my goodness. Okay, so portfolio, just in case anyone else is wondering, that's just your, your little black book. So your, your leather portfolio that you put, there's a pad of paper in there, you put your resume in, your references. When they give you a business card, you tuck it into that folder. So you go to Staples, you get a good business portfolio. So that's what that was. And I thought that was a great question. Um, so bring both of those with you and don't rely on your devices. Um, listen to the question being asked and answer that specific question. It happens <laughs> more often than, than I can tell you where so we'll ask a question and we're intently listening for the answer and it is completely unrelated to the question that we've asked. So if you hear that question being asked a couple of times, you're getting a second and third chance to answer that, in, that question and it's just that you haven't, haven't been listening to the question. And I want you to, we'll talk a, more about this, but rehearse the question. We all ask a version of this question. Bring your resume to life for me. Walk me through your most recent position. Tell me about yourself. Whatever it is, knowing, walking into that interview, you know that you have to bring that entire resume to life. And that's usually where the panic starts. So we'll come back, we'll, we'll address that panic. So we'll come back to that. Arrive no more than 10 minutes early. There, there aren't any gold stars to be handed out if you arrive 50 minutes early, 50 or 45. That's just poor planning. So, and that means then that that person's going to have to adjust their day to fit you in earlier. So no more than 10 minutes early. Um, know what job you have applied for. When you start to apply, make a list of where you've applied. And better yet, print the print the job description or the posting so you've got it. Because I hear this all the time, oh, I was going to print the job posting, but it's no longer online. Right. Most of the job postings don't stay up forever. So make sure that you keep a list of where you have applied the dates and keep a copy of all of the postings just so you've got them. So that when you walk into that interview and they say, well, great, why are you interested in working for ABC company? And why are you interested in this role? You don't have to say, Oh, what role did I apply for? So keep a, keep a list. Um, and research the company. Make sure you've done your homework. Things that will kill interviews. These are my favorites. So the slang. I want all of you to listen to yourselves. And if you hear yourself saying any of, the, any of these words, it's almost like that elastic on your wrist. Like, 
just start pulling it. So if you end, if it, you're going through well, I worked as a receptionist at the, at, at the School of Business part, on a part-time basis. I answered calls, I responded to couriers, and things like that. So don't say, well, tell me, what are those things? Well, things like that. So if you watch, if you end, end things like that. It's not a catch-all. The other one is, at the end of that list, if, I, if you hear yourself saying, you know what I mean? I was the receptionist, I handled couriers, and I did mail, and I did things like that. You know what I mean? That is probably the most common one complaint I hear from my clients, is people using those two phrases. So when you hear, when you're rehearsing out loud, if you hear yourself using those, just pinch yourself. Same with, you know, like, and just any of the slang. It's better to leave silence than to insert an um, or ya, yeah, or hum. So silence is better. If you need to think, there's nothing wrong with it. Body language, watch all of these, eye rolling. If you're talking, we see that if people have had a really unfortunate job experience, there's, there's usually a lot of eye rolling going on. Just keep those eyes forward. Um, eye contact, maintain eye contact with the person that you're speaking with. Not to the point where it's creepy, where the do look away, if you have to think, look away, but maintain good eye contact. So if you, people are uncomfortable, they tend to stare down and look at the table and not really make eye contact. Important to keep that eye contact, but if you're thinking about an answer to a question, you can look away for a minute, then come back again. So that's important. So as well, keep your arms open, not crossed, um, sit up straight, all the things that we always tell you, but these really are important in an interview, sighing. or. Uncontrollable laughter actually comes out a lot. If people are nervous in interviews, ending every comment with just a few giggles, it's not a good idea. So rehearse, when you rehearse out loud, listen for these things. And you also want to come up with answers that actually sound different than the last 14 interviews. So I hear probably every single day, I wanna be in a job I really like. I wanna work with people I really like. Yes, so does everyone. So you need to think, if you're, if you're rehearsing, I'd recommend you get a rehearsal buddy, rehearse your resumes out loud, and if you, if you hear your friend saying, oh, I say that too, then you go, okay, ditch that. You want to have, have phrases and comments that are interesting and don't sound like all of the other one, all of the other interviews. And I, I share this with candidates every single day because people say, oh, interviewing, I, it's so nerve-wracking. It's, I might, I'm a ball of nerves. So think about it this way. Know that that person that you're meeting with wants to simply find every single reason to hire you. They want to stop interviewing, get someone into that position, train them so they can go about their own job again. So just know they're not trying to trip you up. They just want you to give them every bit of information and every bit of a reason on why to hire you. So how many of you spend at least a half an hour to an hour rehearsing your resume out loud before an interview. One gold star. <laughs> Good for you. So how many of you, so in the School of Business, do all of you have to do uh, presentations? Stand up in front of the class, do presentations. Have any of you ever tried to do one of those presentations without rehearsing it out loud? Probably not. Probably not. So think about your resume and an interview. It's a presentation on you. So you absolutely have to take the time to, pre to prepare what it is that you're going to say. Just because you lived, lived it doesn't mean that you'll remember and be able to present it in the proper way. So minimum 30 to 60 minutes. And there's a reason. Rehearse out loud. So I want you to... To, I think standing in front of a mirror is goofy, so I've never done that. But sit down at your, at your desk and rehearse it out loud. The reason you want to do it out loud is that in pressure situations, what happens if, you're, if your stress level goes up, what happens is that the first thing that goes, it's your long-term memory. So all of a sudden, you can't remember where you went to high school, what you did five years ago. It's gone. It's gone. And then, it, then the nerves just compound from there, and then it's a disaster. A few people leave in tears. It happens. So the best thing you can do is rehearse it out loud. That then commits everything you're saying to short, your short-term memory so that you're almost on autopilot. So when you get into, you might walk into an interview, and it's supposed to be with one. It's supposed to be with the director of HR. Well, the general manager decided to join and so did the vice president. So all of a sudden, anxiety level goes from about a four to a 10. 
So if you've rehearsed out loud, your, your memory is not going to fail you. So always do, do rehearse out loud. So this is, the, this is actually the formula of what, when you think, oh, what, do, what the heck do, do interviewers or recruiters, what are they actually after? What we're after is, what was your role? What level did you report to? Ideally, how many of there were you? Were you successful? And why did you leave for every single position? That's what we're after. Uh, and for people newer to their career, I say try and, try and increase your, that, that summary between about five and seven minutes. Um, if you time yourself, I challenge you, time yourself now, walk through your resume, two things will happen. It'll either be about three minutes or it will be somewhere close to 20, of 20 minutes of meandering thoughts. So focus, focus in. Those that are, might have had careers before RDC and are coming back, if you've got 10 or 15 or 20 years, then you actually get a few more minutes. You get about 15 minutes to review your background. Unrehearsed, most people take between, that are experienced in their careers, take between about 45 and 47 minutes when that should take 15. So you want to be, you want to be rehearsed on what it is that you want to talk about. So that's the formula. And I always say this, and this actually, know your career history off the top of your head. I've actually said to candidates before, I'm not entirely convinced that this is your background because you don't seem at all familiar with any of this. And they're like, well, so, or, or the, the candidates that will say, well, can I, can I take a copy, can I just see my resume so I can remember what it is that I've done? So know your history off the top of your head. Um, know your specific accomplishments as we've talked about. Yes, you do, you do need to talk about achievements. That's what we're after. Um, I haven't asked these questions in probably a decade, but what are your strengths? What are your areas of improvement? Some people still love them. So prepare, just be prepared for that, that question. Talk, be prepared to talk about your goals and future and research the company and be able to answer, tell us what you know about our company. And then better off, print some material, put it in your portfolio. Behavioral based questions, everybody has, most everyone says, I hate those questions. Why do, why, do, why do people ask those questions? The reason that we ask behavioral based questions is simply that previous, your past, past behavior is the best indicator of future performance. So how you handled an icky situation or how you handled a big challenge in the past is probably a good indicator to a future employer on how you're going to handle a similar situation again. So prepare for it. What's that sports? I always get offense and defense mixed up. The best offense is a good defense. So just prepare. So prepare for some. When you went above, uh, tell me about a time when you went above and beyond. When you had a conflict with a coworker, when you brought a new idea to your manager, when you disagreed with a decision made by your manager, when you were recognized for outstanding work. There's a million of these questions. Best thing to do when you finish, each time you finish an interview, get back in your car, write down what were the behavioral based questions that they asked you, any ones that you stumbled on, rehearse and put those into your next interview prep. And then just some, a long list of questions or of questions that you can prepare if you want to go beyond. So as I said, bring your resume to life for me or walk me through your, through your background. What is your ideal job? And I actually ask that question to see, just I'm curious. So what is your ideal job? Um, and that's important. What are you working on to improve professionally? I love this question. Tell me something about you I wouldn't know by reading your resume. So age, marital status, not, in, not interesting. If you've, again, jumped out of planes, climbed mountains, volunteered, built houses for Habitat for Humanity, those are interesting things. Um, tell me about your best manager. Tell me what you really like about your present job. Where are you going to be in three to five years? That's a very relevant question. So in the old days, we, in the old days, we used to say, well, tell me where you're going to be in five years and 10 years. And we can't even think of what our phones are going to look like in five years, let alone what our careers are going to look like. So more realistic is think about what's, what you, you've got your next position post college. What does that look like? Then what's the position after that? Next three to five years, where do you want to be? So give some thought, be able to have some ideas on where you want to be, where you want to be headed. Um, biggest achievements in your career, biggest accomplishment. And the last question, and we'll talk about this in the next slide, is there anything else that you were hoping to cover that, we, that I haven't asked you? 
I end all my interviews with that question because when you prepare, know going into your interview that you want, you want to make sure that a number of these items are covered. And if you're prepared, and for whatever reason, we don't get to asking you about athletic achievement or volunteer work, and it, that's important, that's your time. You own, you own the results of that interview as well. So that's your time to, po to share some additional information that we haven't yet touched on. So your turn. At the end of the interview, we'll always say, and any questions for me? And that's usually when people will ask, again, the same questions. Tell me about your benefits program. How many weeks vacation do you have? Uh, and that's usually about the extent of it. So I would challenge you to come up with some more, some really interesting questions. And some of those could be, so you're interviewing a manager you're going to work with. Why do you love working here? What is, it, what is it that you really like about the organization? How long have you been with the company? Why is this role vacant? What are the top skills you're looking for in, in looking for, for the ideal candidate for the role. If I'm successful, what does training look like for me in this position? What would a career look like with the organization? And what do you see as my biggest challenge for this role? So far different, and I've seen many an interview, if they're the same all the way through, and this can absolutely put you out in, in top spot by asking some really, really good questions at the end. References, you will absolutely need at least two. Um, aunts, uncles, cousins, they love you. Of course, they would say lovely things about you, but those aren't real references. Um, college professors, instructors, uh, your direct supervisors or managers or who we, who we are after. So as I said, bring, um, bring, them, bring them with you to the interview. And better yet, let them know, call your references and say, I just had an interview with TAG Recruitment. Sheila Musgrove is going to be calling you. Here's the position and here's why I'm really excited. So help your, in, your referee to give you a really good reference. So call them in advance. Let them know that, they, that it, a call will be coming. Letters are absolutely OK. I skipped over that one. Um, but just know that very likely the interviewer will follow up on follow up with the person who wrote the letter. Um, background screening is becoming more and more common. Um, it's probably 50% of my clients, we do criminal background checks. So the one, two pieces of advice I would give you, if you have had an, any type of indiscretion, get a pardon as soon as you can. I've seen so many amazing candidates lose out on opportunities because they, they hadn't started that pardon process. So if you can do it, it's well worth it. And I only see clients increasing, number of companies increasing who are doing criminal background checks. The second thing is if you have a common name, I won't pick on the John and well, let's say it's Jane Smith or Jane Smith. Uh, there, chances are there probably is another Jane or John Smith in Canada, and even highly probable that Jane or John Smith might have a criminal background. So if you complete those forms, and most times job offers are very time sensitive. So let's say it's Monday, you fill out the criminal background check, I get it back in 48 hours that says, Jane, sorry, it's inconclusive. Now what you actually have to do is go to the RCMP, request your own criminal background because it's an invasion of privacy for that company to say, well, we don't know which Jane Smith or Jane Doe it is, so you then have to go and request your own criminal background check. Meanwhile, that will then take anywhere from 48 to 60 hours. Uh, if you had, if training was going to be starting on the following Monday, you've now lost out on that job opportunity, and I've seen that happen more times than I'd like. So just to think about those, and a good question to ask at the end of the interview, what other steps are in the interview process? And if they say criminal background check, then get ahead of that game. Educational verification is done by, by some clients. Um, and I've seen a, a, what I hope is a fairly simple mistake where people r have written, attended Red Deer College, and they write diploma awarded. And it wasn't, they, you know, people will say, well, I thought they meant, was I in a diploma program? But actually, they've, they've said, yes, I got a received a diploma when, in fact, that diploma was not received. So those are things that can get job, job offers pulled very quickly. Um, cre credit checks are done by mainly it's financial institutions if you're touching money, but not, not, as, um, not as common as they used to be. And one quick second. I need some water. <coughs> and negotiating salary. Did I lose my mic? <laughs> so negotiating salary, I think that's, that's, so you get through the interview and then 
then there's now the part of, oh my gosh, how do I, how do I even start with negotiating salary? So the best thing to do, keep with facts. Um, as I said to the group this morning, you're, you've now graduated from hourly. When you get into corporate, you're always going to be talking about salary on an annual basis. <clears throat> so if you say, I'm interested in $17 per hour, um, that does make you sound a bit more junior. So, and I'm just going, can you turn me off for one quick second so I don't cough, thank you. I think I'm good to go, okay. Uh, it's a lot of talking in one day. So, um, the quick math, if you say, oh my goodness, 40 hours a week times 52 weeks, that's 2,080 hours. If I take $17 an hour times 2,080, any math whizzes? The easy way, just times it by two. So if you, or even take it easy, $20 an hour times two is 40,000. So you always wanna talk in annual once you graduate into a corporate position. Um, be open and realistic. But I always say to candidates, in, this is easier once you secure your first corporate position, where you would say, my last position, I was earning 40,000 per year. Ideally, I'd like to go up from there. Any employer knows you want to go up, not down. So if you give them facts, a reasonable assessment can be made not only on what it is that you have been doing, but as well how well you performed in the interview. There's also a really good website, salaryexpert.com, where you can just check in and say, well, what, is, what, are, what are the going rates? Um, yeah, we all know this, online presence, professional. This actually happened, um, a candidate we were working with in Edmonton went on, we had her on an interview for an administrative assistant with a really high profile company in Edmonton. Um, all was great, she was the lead candidate, they loved her, and then they looked on Facebook and the, there's no offer coming. Now this one wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't a horrible picture or anything, but what she hadn't been truthful with us or the client is that her long-term kind of pipe dream was to go to med school in a couple of years. So she had put an innocent post in the last week that she was thinking about putting in her application for med school. My client, small office, going to invest a lot into the training of this individual said, she didn't tell it, so we saw on Facebook that she wants to go to med school. She's not going to be with us for the next two or three years, likely we'll lose her, so let's, let's see someone else. So something as harmless as what you put on Facebook can, in, in this case, it, there was no other, other way other than Facebook on how that came about. So keep it very, very professional. How many of you are on LinkedIn? Good, a couple, yay, okay, good. LinkedIn is where you want to start to build your LinkedIn profile. That's, that is solely for business purposes. So do, once you build your great resume, get a professional headshot, no pictures of beer or wine with you. Headshot, that's it, have a headshot. I always laugh at the ones where they must be from the tropics or something. It looks like either there's no shirt on or there's just very little on. So, LinkedIn is where you want to be seen in a suit. So headshot, that's it. But do build your profile on LinkedIn. And that's just, we also spend a lot of time looking for people on LinkedIn. So great job board, great resource. Um, these are just fun. And I can't make this stuff up, but I just had to share some, some funnies with you. So question, what, kind of, what type of position are you looking for? Any job, just want a job. It's not a good answer. Hear that daily. Highlight your work history for me. Can I see my resume? Because I don't really remember what I've done. Uh, what's been your career milestone? I haven't liked any of the work I've done. Uh, why are you the best candidate for the role? Oh, I'm probably not. There's likely better candidates than me. I hear this all the time. I just think, my staff always say, they'll send me a note to say, I just heard this. This is great material for, for presentations or for my book. So it's, um, it is interesting. Leaving a voicemail, also coming back to familiar with first and last name, always leave both and speak slowly when you're leaving a voicemail. Daily it happens where we get a seven minute voicemail that's rambling on and then the last four seconds are a phone number that is so jumbled together then we have to listen to that mumbled message again so you might or might not get a, a call back. So practice, again, practice leaving voicemail. First name, last name, slow leaving your phone number. Also be prepared that someone actually might pick up the phone. So be prepared to chat with that person if they actually do call or do pick up the phone. 
I also talked this morning about stalking. So you don't, you don't want to stalk a future employer. I had a gent yesterday, I had interviewed on Friday, between nine and one yesterday, he left me three voicemails, and I could see he called about 12 times. So I'm in my office interviewing, so then I finish my interview, dash for my phone, it's him, and he said, hi, it's Bob. Did you get my messages from this morning? Well, no, Bob, I would have returned your call if I had time. So you don't want to stalk, and again, I've seen lots of offers, just a, a, an opportunity to just fizzle if people have too aggressive a follow-up. Um, an email, this is important, an email is a professional communication piece. Had a candidate last week, he sent me his resume in PDF, so I called him and said, um, I can see your resume, but before we go ahead, I need a, a Word version. So he, I liked his background, I said, great, here's my email address, email me back a copy of your Word, Word, Word document. So what does he do? And I explained to him that communication is really important. This is a very, very professional organization. And this was a really, a really senior logistics position. So he, his email to me had no, nothing in the, in the email, and it was just a copy of his resume. So, you think he got called? No. So he missed a huge opportunity. He could have said, hi, Sheila, thank you so much for your call. I'm really excited about that logistics manager position. Uh, as per your request, attached is the Word document of my, of my resume. I look forward to hearing from you. If I haven't heard from you by Friday, I'll give you, have a great weekend, I'll call you on Monday. So he missed that opportunity and I never did invite him in for an interview because again, that's telling me what his communication style would be when he's in, in work and when, when he is working. So where to look? Major job boards, Career Builder, Monster, Workopolis, Indeed are the big ones. Indeed pulls from everything. Job Shop is another, working, working Calgary, working Edmonton. If you want a full list of all of the, all of the professional recruiters in Alberta, or pardon me, in Canada, is access.org is our professional association. LinkedIn, as I've said, join groups. There is actually an RDC alumni group that Rob Gilgan, who is around, he manages that group. So there's all kinds of postings on there. Uh, if you're interested in, in specific companies, you can follow them. So build LinkedIn. Um, Facebook and Twitter to a certain extent, the college job board, yes, people still do advertise in print. It's rare, but there still are companies. And then company websites. So if you are interested, for example, in working for Shell Canada, they actually would not appear on, it's very unlikely they would appear on Monster because they've got such a big following and such a big presence, you would have to go and research them and go directly to their website. So there's great lists, top 100 companies, top 500 companies in Canada, top 50 in Alberta, and then look at those companies and look specifically at their, at their job boards to find positions that might be of interest. And then, as I said earlier, check up, come back to my website in about a month. You'll be, it, it, it's surprising. I opened my company nine years ago. So my website is nine years old. I don't know how that happened. So it's in a drastic need of a, of a big makeover. So check back in about a month and then there'll be a lot of downloadable, downloadable tools for you on there. Um, we have a Facebook page if you're interested. There's always tips on there. There's off, often just silly things, but often some good tips. If, you're on, if you get on LinkedIn and you'd like to connect, send me an invitation to connect. If you have any questions for me outside of, if you, outside of this forum, you can always reach me. That's my email and phone, phone number. So we'll turn over to questions. And we'll t there's a microphone again over here because I actually can't see you that well. So I, I'm in a good spot where I think I can see just about everyone. But are there any questions that I can answer? Yes, come on down. I feel like Bob Barker there for a second, or Drew Carey. <laughs> I don't have prizes for you, though. <laughs> Brave girl, good for you. Hi, Sheila. I just want to know, would you include uh, your involvement in clubs, societies, or any academic wards that are older than 10 years, if that's all you have? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely you can. If, if there's, in the absence of having not enough, Go back a bit further, absolutely, okay. absolutely, yeah. Thanks. Good, you bet. Any other questions? I know it seems like a long walk to come down here. Hi. Okay. So even if they don't read the cover letters, is it still important to include them? 
it, I would say that's a good question. I know that's the, that's the biggest gasp I get when I do this presentation is what do you mean cover letters are not read? If it's not asked for, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But as I said, you can just make sure that if there's anything really good in that cover letter, that it's repeated in your resume. So just assume, unless it's, some people, smaller companies will often ask for them if, they're, if there's a component of writing or what have you. So if they're asked for, they will get read. If it doesn't, if they're not asked for, then they don't get read. So, yeah, but you can always make it more complete by uploading it, just, to, just make the assumption it won't be. All right, thank you. Hi. I wanted to ask, how do you build your confidence? Because if I ha I've had to change my career because yes. of uh, medical problems. Okay. So how do you uh, build your confidence when you're going into a new career, when you're having an interview? The best thing to do to build confidence, rehearse out loud. So just rehearse, rehearse. So and, and, and anticipate the questions that you're most fearing. So if you're saying, well, why are you starting a new career? It, think, rehearse and prepare for those questions that you're dreading. So if it is, well, what if they're, why, if they're gonna ask me why I'm t switching careers, best, best, best thing to do is just prepare for that question. And the more prepared you are, that's when confidence absolutely goes up. And every, you know what, everyone has a story. Everyone, not, and actually there's, that's a great point. This is, so this is what, so I think all, all of us, when I was sitting here 25 years ago, I thought, well, you leave RDC and then you get a job and then you just keep going up. Well, it doesn't look like that. It looks like this. So that's exactly what your Great. situation has been. It's taken and mine's taken. This is what mine's look like too. So we, we've all taken segues in our career and taken turns and at different junctures in our life. So just rehearse that out loud and just get, just own that answer. And that's the best thing you can do. Okay, good. Any others? Hi. Uh, I've been told that there's a lot of jobs available that aren't advertised, that you have to go door to door. What's the best way of going about doing that? Good, good question. Now, it's interesting. So in, in the old days, when I first started in recruiting in the late 90s, that was the strategy. You would go and you'd, you'd select there might be some people that relate to this, but you'd select the beautiful paper and you would put together this package and then you'd actually drop it off at an office. That used to be a way to stand out. The challenge with that now is that I know when my receptionist gets a resume dropped off at, and she, it, she's, what do we do with paper? So we, need, we always need a soft copy of it. So I would say it, door to door might not be as figuratively as, as it's meant. It would be looking at some of the unusual places like looking at your network on LinkedIn, looking at the job board on LinkedIn, um, networking within the community, networking within, within your, your, your volunteer circle. So when we talk about n res or positions that aren't posted, that's usually, it's more of, oh, by the way, uh, we need this type of person. Um, and and a, an example of that would be, as I was just thinking, one of my clients, uh, I've placed, four project managers with him and three interior designers this year. He has never once posted any of those positions. So that would be an example where a, a hidden job market is also looking at, looking at what recruiters do have listed because very often we've got such a strong relationship with our clients, they never bother to post and they just come to us. So there's that. There's then the, it might be you're at a barbecue and someone says, well, so-and-so is looking for a part-time accountant. Oh, well, you know what? I know so-and-so who I work, I sit on a volunteer board with who's looking. So it's about letting people know that you're looking and what your skills are. So lots of different things, but I wouldn't probably recommend doing too much door-to-door -door just because we all have so much noise during the day that it's sometimes difficult to pick up. Unless, of course, that's noted in an ad to say drop by, then by all means do. Does that answer your question? Okay, thanks. Hello. Hello. Um, so say we're starting a two-year diploma program. Okay. Um, and we're kind of looking to get into volunteering just to beef up our resumes a little bit. Yeah. Should we try to gear volunteering towards that kind of role that we're looking for or could it just be anything? Well, ideally, the more related experience you can get where the more related experiences. So, for example, let's say um, let's say you want to get more 
technical experience where, let's say, for instance, you want to build a database and you think that that would help you with a career. Well, you could volunteer with um, an animal rescue foundation that needs to build a, a database, or you could go to a professional association, which is more of a straight arrow to where you want to go. So we'd say it doesn't matter necessarily the organization, it's more what you're doing. So find, find volunteer work that helps to enhance your skills, um, and that's going to be, because you want to build more now, more skills that are going to be marketable to, um, to an employer. Okay, great. Perfect. Any other, any other final questions? Okay. Well, super, I've got my email. If there's any questions, drop me a line. Just tell me that where we met. And um, and happy to answer any other questions. I'll be here for a few minutes. But thanks so much for your attention. It's always great to be back here. <laughs>